I am Sue Erickson. I am Hub Director of Open Learning 19 for this iteration of Open Learning. I'm thrilled to be here with Peter Suber, who is Director of the Harvard Office for Scholarly Communication. And um, Peter, that's in the Harvard Library, is that correct? Yes, that's right. That's great. So you and I are both coming from libraries, uh, one small, one big. Um, and here we are to talk about open access. Peter, can you talk about the different kinds of open access and how they are different and similar? Sure. <clears throat> Let me start by saying thanks for inviting me. And I'm especially excited by this session because you're crowdsourcing the questions. I love that. And if I understand correctly, it's part of a MOOC. It's part of a course. And, That's right. And it's a connectivist MOOC. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Uh, to me, open access is a kind of access. It's not necessarily a kind of research. It's not a kind of business model. It's not a kind of license. Uh, it's a kind of access. And there are uh, many kinds or degrees or flavors of access that go under the name open access. And I can describe those kinds. Uh, if I try to put a name on each one, then I know from experience we'll get into verbal disputes about the names. And so I'd rather talk about the kinds without being uh, finicky about the names. <clears throat> uh, there is primarily, or first of all, open access through journals. So when you publish an article and the journal itself makes the work open access, uh, that's one kind. Uh, it's usually called gold open access. And again, without uh, making it a matter of definition, uh, gold open access uh, ought to be called gold open access uh, regardless of the journal's business model. So. Uh, some open access journals charge article processing charges or publication fees. Uh, most do not, but it's still gold whether they charge those fees or not. But it's still important to recognize this subdivision within journal-based OA, namely fee-based journal OA and no-fee journal OA. Those are significantly different, uh, especially if you don't have funding to pay the fee. Uh, the other major type is repository-based open access, usually called green open access. And just as gold open access doesn't require uh, the journal to charge a fee, uh, repository-based open access does not require an embargo, does not require uh, uh, the exclusion of an open license. Uh, repository or green OA can be embargo-free, in other words, can be immediate, uh, can be unembargoed, and it can be under a Creative Commons license. Uh, I'm making the point of saying this because many people overlook that, just as they overlook that uh, journal-based open access can be without fee. Uh, there are other kinds of open access that are not talked about as much, and that's kind of a shame because there are other opportunities that deserve discussion. Uh, wikis are open access, discussion forums are open access, blogs are open access, preprint servers are open access, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks are open access. Uh, there'll be far more uh, media and uh, venues for open access in the future uh, than there are today. Uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves to journals and repositories. A lot of the discussion about open access is actually about what you could call post-journal publishing, or the evolution of journals into something else, something new or something different. Uh, we should keep our minds open to that. Those things, and there's not just one of them, uh, could well be open access, should be open access, but it may be uh, a stretch to call them journals. And so we should uh, be ready to use different terms for them as they arrive and as we start to use them. But to go back to the main question, what is open access? It's a kind of access. What kind of access? Uh, first of all, it has to be free of charge. And uh, secondly, it has to be free of what I call permission barriers. That is, if it's all rights reserved copyright, uh, it's not very open, uh, even if it's free of charge. Uh, by the way, being free of charge and all rights reserved is still open in a certain way. It's better than not being free of charge. Uh, but if uh, a journal or a repository uh, uses an open license, like a Creative Commons license, then it's more open than if it didn't. That is, if users have rights beyond fair use, uh, that's more open. And uh, if you know Creative Commons, there's uh, at least seven flavors of license uh, that give users permission to do things beyond fair use. So those are seven more flavors of open access. Uh, I favor CC BY, that is the most liberal of those licenses, but I don't think the definition of open access requires it. Uh, but rather than talk about what the definition requires, which gets back into terminology wars, we should just acknowledge that there are many different flavors and kinds. But if you permit uses beyond fair use, and if you uh, charge nothing for access, uh, then it's open. And we can then talk about the different flavors or degrees. 
How does peer review work for open access journals? What is the process there? But the shortest way to answer that is to say it operates exactly the way peer review operates at other peer review journals. Open access does not require any particular kind of peer review. It can use the most conventional, conservative, traditional type of peer review, uh, or it can use some very innovative types of peer review, including what's now called open peer review and post-publication peer review. But to be open, you're not required to take any of those steps. And in the early days, open access journals deliberately chose to use conservative, conventional kinds of peer review. Uh, my reading on this is that they only wanted to tweak the access variable so that nobody thought they were second rate. <clears throat> and by the way, there was a widespread uh, presumption that open access journals had to be second rate. Uh, there was no ground for that, but why feed that misunderstanding by changing the peer review model at the same time? So many journals deliberately did not change the peer review model. They used conventional peer review, uh, and they simply made the result open access. But uh, as time has gone on, more and more you know, open access journals, but also more and more subscription journals are willing to tinker with peer review. Open access, in my view, is compatible with literally every kind of peer review. So we shouldn't be surprised to see some open access journals use pre-publication peer review, some use post-publication peer review. Uh, some use anonymous peer review, some use attributed peer review. Uh, every variation on the theme you can think of could be used by an open access journal. Uh, there's one kind of peer review that does require an open access journal, but that kind itself is not required by open access, and it's an option, uh, not a necessity, and that's open peer review. If you make the submitted manuscript open access, uh, then you could do a couple of things. You could either evaluate it uh, in-house, that is, you could have your editorial board uh, evaluate it or uh, look for referees to evaluate it while the manuscript is sitting out there for the whole world to see. Uh, or you could invite the public to start commenting on it and use some of those public comments as input to the peer review process. This obviously uses uh, open access, and it would be impossible if a journal were not willing to make at least that stage of the work open. And when a manuscript is submitted to that kind of journal, the unrefereed manuscript is open. You could call that a preprint. Uh, and then if it's later approved by peer review, uh, maybe after some revision and negotiation, the approved version is put up uh, as a separate version with a different version number and a date and metadata to indicate that it's been peer reviewed. So in that sense, the early version and at least one later version are all open. Uh, that model of peer review does require open access. The other models don't require it. So if a scholar wants to look for an open access journal to publish in, um, what should they keep in mind? They should keep in mind that some are high in quality and some are not. Some have high uh, uh, prestige and some don't. Uh, some are honest and some are not. Uh, some have good reputations in the field. Maybe that goes back to prestige and some don't. If you care about impact factor, uh, and I don't think you should, but many do, uh, some have high impact factors and some do not. In other words, they're highly various and don't be surprised by the variety. The other thing to keep in mind is that some do charge article processing charges, and uh, some don't. Uh, and the journal that fits your paper best, uh, by discipline, let's say, uh, might charge a fee. And so you should be prepared to find funding for the fee. Uh, many authors assume that every journal that charges a fee requires the author to pay the fee out of pocket. That's false. Uh, the best data shows that authors pay those fees out of pocket only about 12% of the time and that most of the time those fees are paid by the author's funder, that is their grant, or by their employer. Uh, not every funder is willing to pay these fees, not every university has a fund to pay these fees, but together uh, the funders and the universities that are willing add up to 88% of the cases where fee-based papers are published. So don't be deterred by the fact that a given journal charges a fee. Uh, look at your grant if you have one, look at your institution, to see whether there's a pot of money there to help you pay that fee. Uh, many authors who haven't been following the details of open access uh, are alarmed by the fee. They think they must pay it out of pocket, and of course they almost never can, so they think they can't not publish there. Uh, they also tend to think it's an illegitimate business model, that it's vanity publishing. Uh, that's false. Uh, nothing should be called vanity publishing that uses peer review. <coughs> uh, and again, if you look close, they do use peer review. Again, some do it well, some do it badly, some do it honestly, some don't. But don't think of it uh, 
as an intrinsically dishonest business model. It's not at all. There are legitimate fee-based journals, and then there are the illegitimate ones. Uh, there are these journals called predatory journals. I just call them scams, uh, dishonest journals. They tend to charge fees because that's the whole point. They want to make money. Uh, they either do little or no peer review. They take advantage of the desperation of authors to publish something. And if you have ever felt desperate to publish something, you'll know the feeling. Uh, people worry about authors being deceived. Uh, I do. Uh, I want to warn authors against those, and I want to warn readers against those. But one thing you should do if you worry about a journal, uh, perhaps because you've never heard of it, uh, you don't have any reason to think it's uh, bad, but you've never heard of it, uh, just look at the papers themselves. This is the acid test. Uh, there are guides to journals that are uh, predatory and those that are not, and I can recommend some. But to me, the acid test is for you and people in your field, uh, friends and colleagues, to actually read some of the articles. Uh, are they good or bad? Would you be proud to be associated with them, or would you be embarrassed to be associated with them? Now, let that be the test. I'll just add a plug for libraries. I know a lot of librarians are getting involved in um, helping identify um, good open access journals, and also some libraries are offering um, some funding um, for those authors, so that that's right. two areas that libraries are helping with. Right. If you're a university-based researcher, uh, ask a librarian whether your university has a fund to pay APCs. It's not obvious where to go, but librarians could help you figure that out. Can you talk a little about creative and innovative new roles that you see for traditional publishers who want to adapt to open access and support uh, what this, this person asking the question refers to as the researcher's tribe? First, you're referring to conventional publishers, so I suppose you mean the non-open publishers. Uh, first of all, they could consider flipping to open access. Uh, they have probably thought about it and rejected it, or they wouldn't be in this category, but uh, I should at least mention that. And one reason to mention it is that uh, many publishers have thought about it. Maybe they raised it at a board meeting once, uh, and they rejected it because they thought there was only one business model for open access journals, and they decided it wouldn't fit them, that it would not work for them. Uh, that's only fair for that one business model. Uh, there are dozens of business models for open access journals. Uh, I and some research assistants maintain a list of these at the open access directory. Uh, you don't have to go there, but it's one convenient place that pulls them all together and links to examples. Any journal that actually raises the question whether they could afford to switch to open access should look at multiple business models before they decide that none of them works for them. If they focus on one and it really doesn't work for them, which is possible, they should not conclude prematurely that no other model will work for them. It's very possible that some other one will. If they're not themselves open access, if their articles are not open access from the journal, uh, they should at least let the authors deposit a copy of their article in an open repository, for example, their institutional repository. That's called self-archiving. Most subscription-based journals do permit self-archiving. That's good. Uh, but Many of them don't, and so I recommend that the ones that don't do it today, that don't allow that today, should start to allow it. Early on, uh, a majority of publishers did this. That was an early victory of the open access movement. Even today, it's kind of an invisible victory. Most authors who publish in subscription journals still don't realize they have the right to self-archive. That is, the publisher itself is giving them that right, and it's on the author to take advantage of that opportunity. If they don't, they can't blame the publisher. They should uh, take the step and do it. They should also read their contract and see exactly what the terms are. Publishers used to allow this, uh, the majority of publishers used to allow this with no embargo. Uh, as soon as you wanted, you could put the right version of that file in a repository. Over time, some publishers have added restrictions to this permission. Uh, you can do it with a certain embargo. <clears throat> uh, you can do it with a certain disclaimer on the text of the version that you deposit. Uh, most of them uh, do have version restrictions. You cannot do this with the so-called version of record, the version published in the journal with the publisher's look and feel and the pagination and any unilateral copy editing done by the publisher after peer review. But you can do it with the peer-reviewed version, the version approved by peer review, and that's the version that matters most for scholarship. One snag is that it's often hard for authors to put their hands on that version of the file. Uh, it used to be a little easier when peer review negotiations were done by email and 
authors and publishers traded files by email attachments, and they always had a copy of every version. But nowadays, that's usually done through version control systems on the web. Uh, and so the authors often don't have that version. So another thing publishers could do is either uh, email the author, the accepted author manuscript upon publication. So the author could then deposit it if they wanted to, or uh, at least give authors permission or you know, some means to enter the version control system and extract that version so that they could put it in. There's a, a exciting new initiative called direct to AAM, where two is the digit two, and AAM stands for accepted author manuscript. And this is a series of instructions on how to use the different uh, software, uh, journal management software uh, at different publishers to get into the version control system and extract that AAM for deposit in a repository. Uh, most of these platforms actually allow that, but most authors don't know how to use it for that purpose. So it helps to put the instructions together, and then it helps to alert authors that this is a real possibility. If you are allowed to deposit that version in your repository, then learn how to get your hands on that version of the file. By the way, the next step is for publishers to let proxies do this on behalf of authors. Uh, even if authors could do this in principle if they read the instructions, uh, I think in the long run it'll be better if uh, others can do it for them on their behalf, uh, student workers, assistants, librarians, and others, uh, then much more often than now, we would actually get those files into the repository. Another thing these journals could do is stop requiring transfer of copyright. Publishers do need rights to publish, but they don't need exclusive rights, and they don't need the full copyright. What they need is a license to publish, and they could say to authors, uh, you keep the copyright, but give us the following license that we need in order to publish so that we are not infringing copyright ourselves. Another thing they could do is uh, stop following what's called the Inglefinger rule. That is, stop refusing to consider manuscripts that have already circulated as preprints. Uh, this will encourage preprint sharing by authors. It will stop punishing authors for preprint sharing, and it will stop, let's say, frightening authors who worry about the Inglefinger rule. Uh, I think the Inglefinger rule is in decline, and most journals don't use it today. The problem is, uh, even the journals that you know, do use it don't say that on their website, and the journals that don't use it don't say that on their website, or rarely say it. So either way, it would help if journals would say on their websites whether they welcome preprints as submissions, or whether they bar preprints as submissions. Uh, then authors who like the idea of preprint archiving could know which journals were still open to them. Uh, I think authors now, uh, many authors, stand back from preprint archiving because they're afraid that the journals where they might want to publish follow this rule and would exclude their work. Uh, another, uh, this is more for publishers than journals, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, stop lobbying against strong open access policies by funding agencies and governments. Uh, when you do that, you simply antagonize the world of researchers, researchers themselves and research institutions. Uh, these policies are in the public interest. You're lobbying against the public interest. It's obvious you are lobbying in favor of a private interest at the expense of the public interest. If you're really trying to uh, warm uh, up the research tribe, as the question put it, uh, to you and your journals, then stop doing that. Uh, let the funders and the government agencies uh, adopt the policies that seem wise to them, uh, that seem to be in the public interest for them, and then adapt to that. Don't lobby against it. Something that seems small, but to me is actually large, don't publish in PDF only. Uh, many people love PDF, uh, but you can publish in other file formats alongside PDF and still have PDF. If you publish in EPUB, HTML, or XML, then you're much friendlier to uh, visually impaired users, mobile users, text mining, and users in low bandwidth parts of the world. Uh, that's very important. Uh, we can make a work open access in the technical sense and still uh, prevent a huge fraction of researchers who would like to read the work from actually being able to read it. That's a file format problem. And by the way, note for the rest of us, stop calling published articles PDFs. That's a file format. It's not a genre. Another thing, open, require open data to the articles that you publish and require it on the date of publication. This is required for reproducibility. If you publish, a, if, if you're in the sciences where uh, reproducibility matters, then uh, require that open data and brag that you're doing it so that uh, people can actually try to reproduce the work. 
One reason this could be a fairly e easy step for publishers is that they traditionally don't own any rights to the data. Um, they don't have to buy the data. Uh, they don't lose any income from having the author share the data. It's not like the text of the article itself. Uh, so in the early days, many publishers supported open data without supporting open access to articles because it was an easy step for them. Uh, but they should follow the same logic today and require open data uh, regardless of what they do for their articles. Uh, it would improve the quality of the work. Uh, similarly, they could require authors to get ORCIDs. This is a standard ID for uh, publishing scholars. Uh, an ORCID is to a researcher roughly what an ISBN is to a book. Uh, and there's kind of a chicken and egg problem right now. Many authors are reluctant to get ORCIDs because journals don't seem to need them or require them. And journals are reluctant to require them because most authors don't have them. Uh, and it's a standoff. But it would benefit everybody. It would benefit publishers and authors to start using ORCIDs. You know, publishers are in the best position to break the vicious circle by simply requiring it. It takes 30 seconds to get an ORCID. Uh, they're not going to antagonize their authors. Uh, authors want to be published in that journal or they would not have submitted there. Uh, just tell them, take this 30-second detour, get an ORCID, and then come back. One more thing. Uh, if you have the income or the revenue, you might not. But if you do, then consider digitizing your back file and acknowledge that sufficiently old volumes of your back file are not making you income today or are not making you much income. And you could do more for uh, research and your own uh, name by making the back file open access. And if you don't want to make the back file starting last month open access, then do it with the back file starting last year or a couple of years ago. Uh, but don't let it sit uh, offline or behind a paywall uh, when you could be benefiting everybody, including yourselves, by sharing it. There's so much that publishers could do, and it sounds like they could start just about anywhere. So we do have some questions that have come in through the chat. Um, and um, so I'll read you a couple of those to share. Um, you state that open access isn't universal access. Yep. How do you see open access assisting in creating or improving the four bar barriers you identify, censorship, language, handicap, connectivity? Yeah, that's a really good question. <clears throat> uh, the question included the barriers, but let me just say them for everybody. Uh, to me, open access removes two kinds of barriers, namely price barriers and permission barriers, but it might leave four other barriers in place, which would be regrettable, but one of them is censorship barriers. Uh, open access works can still be censored by ISPs and by governments and by schools. Uh, open access work can be in just one language and thereby exclude people who don't read that language. Uh, works can be open access, but not friendly to visually impaired users, and so those users could be excluded. Uh, and then there's the digital divide, people who simply don't have internet connectivity, and works can be open access and leave out or exclude all those people behind the digital divide. Uh, what can open access itself do to solve those problems? Uh, it's hard. <clears throat> uh, let's take censorship. I don't see that open access by itself can stop an ISP or a government from wanting to censor things or taking steps to censor things. Uh, the most it can do is to help share uh, ideas or knowledge, and those can be used to lobby against censorship, but it can't actually uh, undo censorship or stop these uh, actors from censoring. It might do something on language. Uh, language barriers are only a problem until machine translation gets very good. And right now, machine translation is, let's say, medium. Uh, it could be a lot better. Uh, and one way that machine translation gets better is by having a huge corpus of work uh, to train uh, artificial intelligence uh, software or natural language processing. And the more open access work we have, the larger the corpus we have for training that software. Uh, so if you've noticed over the years that natural language processing is getting better, I think we have open access itself to credit for some of that. Of course, we have good software engineers to credit for that as well, but they need a big corpus for training. Uh, I don't think open access itself uh, can help overcome handicap access barriers, but if publishers do go beyond PDF-only publishing uh, to friendlier file formats like EPUB, HTML, and XML, then uh, assistive software can read those files much more easily than they can read PDF, uh, and that breaks down the barrier for those readers. So it's not open access itself that does that. It's the choice 
of file formats that does that. And so I encourage publishers to pick friendlier file formats. They don't have to abandon PDF, just use friendlier file formats alongside PDF. Uh, and then on connectivity, again, uh, to me this is like censorship. I don't think open access itself can overcome the digital divide. Uh, just the other day I tweeted the fact, which was new to me, that the human race reached the point at which half of us had internet connectivity just three months ago. Wow. You might have thought this happened 10 years ago, but it happened three months ago. So half the world has no internet access, even today. Uh, there are lots of steps we could all take to uh, accelerate the connection of the world, but I don't think open access itself is one of them. Again, except by using open access to help uh, persuade people that this is worth doing. I love the connection that you made to um, open access uh, and um, natural language processing. That's, some, that's a connection I had not thought to make before, but it makes perfect sense. As you said, they have to have a, a body of text to um, get the practice in. Um, right. To improve those. In the early days, uh, machine translation was based on human understanding of how language worked. Uh, but long after it became available online, software engineers thought of this better idea. Uh, let's take a piece of text that has been, uh, let's say, written in English, but well translated into French, uh, and let's do that times a million. That is, let's get millions of texts like that, uh, and then have the software just learn, oh, this is how good human translators do it. Uh, next time I see that phrase, <clears throat> I'll know that it's an idiom that's not in the dictionary, or I'll know to do it this way rather than that way. And they started with documents from the UN because they're well translated, not just into one language, but into a dozen languages. But now they use essentially everything on the web, and why not? <clears throat> uh, and it's actually gotten very good, very fast. It's still not so good that we can say language barriers have been torn down, but they're certainly much lower than they used to be. We've got another question that's come in through the chat. Um, I'm curious about academic incentive or the reward systems in place today. We want new innovations like open access or open educational resources to take hold, but the traditional peer review and reward system, especially uh, just publish something push, uh, seem to draw researchers away from new innovations. What suggestions do you have around that? Yeah, I have a lot of suggestions. The problem here is that suggestions have to target promotion and tenure committees. And they're hard to change. Again, it's not that they're uh, regressive, it's that every department has its own. You can't change promotion and tenure practices for a whole university by persuading one group of people. Uh, at least not at my university or any other one that I've heard of. You have to go department by department. And the members of these committees are often friends of open access. Uh, they're, again, scholars, they're not publishers. Uh, but they're academically conservative. That is, they had to climb a certain ladder to get in, and they want to make sure the next generation has to climb a ladder to get in. Uh, when I talk to them about removing disincentives for open access, uh, they always jump to the conclusion that this is about lowering standards uh, and admitting people uh, of lower quality or people whose work is of lower quality. Of course, that's not true, but it's the first thing they think of, and it takes a half hour to talk them down from that and say, no, use the very same standards of quality you used to use. Uh, but when somebody publishes a first-rate work in a journal you never heard of, judge the work, don't judge the journal. <clears throat> uh, that's not too hard to say, it's not too hard to understand. It may be hard to do, however, and one thing that promotion and tenure committees do is to uh, make their work easy by following quantitative metrics, which might oversimplify what we mean by quality. And so journal impact factors are irresistible here because they're quantitative and they're uh, easily obtained. <clears throat> And if you don't have time to read all the articles by all the candidates in the pool, and of course you don't, then you fall back on something else. I get that, and uh, I was a faculty member for most of my career. Uh, however, when faculty members do that, then they're outsourcing judgments of quality to publishers instead of owning judgments of quality uh, inside the institution. They ought to do that, even if it takes more of their time. Uh, again, it's complicated because uh, hiring committees tend to specialize in the area in which they're hiring, and so they're competent to read the works by the candidates, but promotion and tenure committees are often not. Uh, 
specialists in that area. <clears throat> and they have to fall back on something else. Uh, so they trust journals. And again, most journals are trustworthy in this regard, but trusting journals here means uh, using quantitative metrics that oversimplify many of the dimensions of quality. So one of the suggestions I you know, forgot to mention a minute ago is that uh, journals should use alt metrics to supplement uh, other metrics, standard or conventional metrics. It's not that all alt metrics are probative or very revealing about quality and impact, but they're more revealing than just one impact, especially uh, one uh, metric, especially in a metric that we know to be uh, a gross oversimplification. And so the more data we have about uh, work's impact and uptake, the better. Uh, but even better than having a large number of metrics is having people in the same field read the darn work. And it's much easier to judge uh, whether uh, a candidate has published in certain high prestige journals than to judge whether her articles are any good. And we just have to buckle down and say, we're going to go the second way. We have to. This is our institution. I'm going to ask um, Gardner Campbell to unmute himself because I know he has a question for you. Gardner? Thank you, Sue, and uh, thanks, Peter, for being part of this conversation today. It's always great to hear from you, and I always take away about 10 or 15 insights. Uh, in, your, in your own open access sharing, you, you exemplify what it is that you recommend. So thanks. I wanted to ask you about the uh, report of the expert group to the European Commission that just came out uh, with the future of scholarly publishing and scholarly communication. And uh, this is a good segue from what you're, you're just describing, because that group and uh, their uh, leader, Jean-Claude Guidon in particular, they keep returning to this idea that there, there are not just technical and not just policy barriers, but there are cultural barriers as well. Yes. And uh, the report actually goes right to what you've said, which is, just to quote from it, the conclusion is actually simple. The evaluation of research is the keystone. And Guidon and his group point to the fact that that's what faculty ought to own. Yes. But we have not. So several times just now you've talked about how difficult that is uh, and how tempting it is to rely on quantitative proxies for really learned qualitative evaluation. Uh, do you see any uh, breaks in that log jam? Do you see any evidence of hope on the horizon especially as higher education seems to be rushing toward uh, quantitative proxies and away from qualitative engagement. I'm just wondering, do you have, do you have anything hopeful on the horizon you see? Uh, there are some grounds for hope. The one is that many of us have been saying uh, this for years, and so it's starting to sink in. Uh, many people acknowledge that open access is held back primarily by cultural obstacles, not by technical, financial, or legal obstacles. Uh, on the whole, we've solved the technical, financial, and legal problems, but we still have the cultural ones. Uh, another ground for hope is that the open access movement is no longer one or two years old. It's uh, more than 20 years old. And uh, cultural change takes a long time, but the long time is starting to pass. And so we're getting to the point where uh, more people are past the oversimplifications that held us back earlier. Uh, I talk with lots of promotion and tenure committees directly, face-to-face, uh, because that's how you have to do it. You have to go to each one separately. Uh, and many of them are very sympathetic. In fact, some of them have told me that they will change their practices, uh, and then they find it hard to do it, but uh, they get the point. They see why it's desirable. And I don't ask them, uh, by the way, to favor open access publication, but to stop disfavoring open access publication. Just remove the disincentive and let the quality of the work speak for itself. Uh, and again, they see the point. They know it's not about quality anymore, uh, and they ought to reward that. Uh, by the way, on that point, there was a recommendation from Europe uh, about a decade ago that said, in addition to looking for the conventional kinds of quality, like rigorous research, we should also look for quality of access. <clears throat> That's a kind of quality, too. So uh, a work can be good to a certain level, uh, but it could be behind a paywall or it could be open access. Uh, quality of access should count. Maybe not as much as uh, rigor, but it should count. And so when we judge quality, let's acknowledge there are many kinds of quality, and quality of access is one of those. Another ground for uh, hope is that most young researchers support open access. And as I put it in my book, it's a matter of generational change. Uh, or as Max Planck put it, uh, we progress one funeral at a time. And so uh, there'll be a time when 
promotion and tenure committees are dominated by people who support open access. Journal publishers will be dominated by people who support open access. University departments and schools uh, will be dominated by those who support open access. Funders uh, and government agencies will be dominated by them. So the world is slowly changing, not necessarily because our arguments stuck and people were, you know, changed their minds, but because uh, different people are taking the place of older people who didn't quite see the logic of this. And just as a quick follow-up, I wonder if you think that over time uh, we'll see more evidence of uh, a lack of good faith on the part of some of the big corporations like Elsevier and so forth. Uh, and finally, the, the light will begin to dawn that perhaps uh, we have not only outsourced our responsibilities, but uh, the people who we've charged with this responsibility are not themselves necessarily of the highest integrity. The reason I'm reluctant to uh, say that's true is that there's been a lot of evidence for a long time that publishers have not been acting with integrity or that they've been holding us back uh, for the sake of profit and that their excuses for doing so are bad faith. Uh, for example, even after the University of California mass cancellation of Elsevier journals, the Elsevier response was, uh, we do everything we can to improve access for the sake of researchers, which is false. They don't do everything they can. Uh, they do everything they can to sell uh, their journals, not to uh, advance research. Uh, so they always turn their position into one of support for researchers because it sounds like good marketing, but everybody can see through that. But the fact that everybody can see through it doesn't mean they will change their mind and stop submitting work to Elsevier journals. If so, they would have done that a long time ago. Uh, on the other hand, more and more people are getting angry. And again, I don't think the open access movement has to uh, aim at the undermining of any particular publisher. It has to aim at providing open access. That is, uh, I think the goal is constructive and not destructive. Uh, but everybody who is angry with a given publisher and stops submitting there, uh, is submitting somewhere else that they approve, and that can be constructive change. And, and I do see more and more of that. Uh, long ago, I uh, personally vowed not to do peer review at uh, non-open journals or with publishers who lobby against uh, open access policies. Uh, that kind of move is starting to spread. Again, it's not uh, landslide, but more and more people are taking steps like that. Uh, a couple years ago, Harvard got... Uh, about 24 takedown notices for Elsevier articles. They were not in our repository. I'm proud to say our repository has never had a takedown notice, but they were on personal websites of our faculty. And all 24 of those authors were angry that Elsevier did this to them. And I used it as a teaching moment. I said, you signed a contract that gave Elsevier certain rights. Elsevier is enforcing those rights. That is legally, it's in the right. And if you don't like what it's doing, then don't give your rights to publishers who act this way. <clears throat> uh, and I think some of them got it. Uh, but again, you only get it if you've received the takedown notice. Uh, watching it happen across the globe isn't going to do it for you. Uh, but again, time is passing, so more and more people are having experiences like that. This has been such a helpful conversation. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to share, Peter, that... Um was something can, you wanted to be sure to mention? Uh, I'll just follow up on your last point. It's true that we have to educate our peers about their open access options. And in the early days, this was a little easier because there were fewer options. And we could explain those options pretty briefly. And in one session, we could inspire people to go out and exercise those options. Now there are many more options, and we ought to accept that's a side effect of progress. It's good to have more options. But it's harder to explain what they are. <clears throat> Uh, but when we find people who misunderstand their options or who uh, labor under uh, false understanding and think certain options that are actually open are closed, then we have to correct them. So first, we should educate ourselves about our options. Uh, we should make our own work open. That is, we should take advantage of these options to make our own work open. Uh, we should do our best in talking with colleagues to make sure they understand their options. And when we hear them say something untrue about open access, uh, then we should correct them. And scholars tend to listen most to their fellow scholars, to their peers. And uh, I'm working as a librarian now, although I used to be a faculty member, and I just know librarians will agree with me. Uh, they tend not to listen to librarians. Uh, <clears throat> uh, librarians it can be very successful in giving a presentation that changes faculty minds, but the uh, person they listen to more is their fellow colleague down the hall, their fellow faculty member. And the same goes for administration, administrators. They don't listen to administrators. 
uh, much. They don't listen to librarians much. Uh, they listen to fellow scholars. So publishing scholars who understand their options should first exercise them and make their own work open. But then they should talk to their friends down the hall, uh, to their friends at conferences, uh, to the people who publish in their journal, to the people in their society, uh, and get them to understand their options and take advantage of them. Um, we do have one more question coming in through the chat, um, asking if you would say a little bit about Plan S, the strengths and weaknesses of the plan, and if you think it'll get more traction here in the U.S. Yeah, it's a good question. Unfortunately, it's not a short one. So if we have time, I'll start, and you can tell me if we're running sure, over. Sure, go for it. Uh, first, Plan S is a proposed policy. It's not yet a policy. Uh, it's a proposed policy from initially 11 funders in Europe. And the plan was for these funding agencies to adopt an open access policy. And when a funder has an open access policy, it says, in effect, if you take our money, then you have to make your work open access on the following terms. Uh, it's a good idea. That is, funder policies are a good idea because they really get the attention of funders, uh, I mean, uh, uh, researchers. Researchers want their grants, and they will do what the funder requires uh, to get the money. Uh, I would say funders have the most leverage in the whole system for changing behavior. Uh, and funders know that. That's why they adopt these policies. And what's strong or interesting about this is that it's a consortial funder uh, uh, policy. It's not just one funder doing it by itself. It's 11. And by the way, the 11 has grown to 16. Uh, and initially, all the uh, founding members, the 11 funders, were European. Now there's some non-European funders, including uh, one in the U.S., uh, namely the Gates Foundation, and that's private. So we've gone from public funders to private funders as well. We've gone from European funders to non-European funders. Uh, one of the objections in the early days was, even if it's a good policy, this group of funders together only accounts for, let's say, 8 to 12% of funded research in the world. Uh, but since then, the entire nation of India and China uh, have said they might be willing to sign on. Uh, and as you might know, China just surpassed the U.S. as publishing the most research articles of any country in the world. So that could make a huge difference. Uh, there were also objections that uh, this wouldn't work in the global south, but again, it's hard to maintain that objection when India is willing to sign on. Uh, however, there are still objections. Uh, it's a gold-leaning policy. I wouldn't say it's a gold-only policy. There is a green compliance option. One of my objections is that the green compliance option is narrow and difficult. Uh, and the more narrow and difficult it is, the harder it is for early career researchers uh, to make a career for themselves. Uh, they're under pressure from their promotion and tenure committees to publish in high prestige journals, which might not be open access. The best solution for them is to let them do that so they get their career, but then to deposit a copy in a repository to use the green option. And if a funder policy permits green to satisfy the policy, then early career researchers can get the best of both worlds. But if the green option is narrow and difficult, they cannot do that then they're torn, and basically they're the rope and the tug of war between the promotion and tenure committee and their funder. That's bad. It's bad for early career researchers. So I've urged the Plan S coalition to widen the green option. Uh, if I would like to see a funder policy to be essentially neutral or agnostic on green and gold. Uh, make the work open any way you can, and by open we mean the following. They could even have some criteria for it, and they do, by the way. They say no embargo, uh, CC by. Uh, that's fine. Those are good criteria. But you can do that under green. It doesn't have to be gold. Uh, another objection is about academic freedom. Uh, the theory here is that this will limit the freedom of authors to submit work to the journals of their choice. And first, we should start by saying, yes, it will. And any funder policy does do that. Uh, in this case, because it's a gold leaning policy without a strong green option, uh, it limits this freedom even more. If there were a good green option, you could publish in essentially any journal and just make a copy of the work open access. Uh, but because it's currently very gold-leaning, uh, it limits the number of journals in which you can publish. Uh, many people point out that roughly 12% of peer-reviewed journals currently comply with the Plan S criteria. That's a little misleading because the purpose of Plan S is to change publisher behavior. And if it's ever adopted, uh, especially by 16 or more publishers, especially, I'm sorry, uh, funders, uh, especially uh, if you throw in India and China, then far more than 12 will comply because they will feel pressure to comply. Uh, analogy, uh, in 2008, when the NIH policy became mandatory, uh, very few publishers were in compliance with what NIH wanted, uh, but uh, 
soon after, 100% of publishers were in compliance. I don't expect 100% of publishers will comply with Plan S, but uh, far more than 12. So it's misleading to point to the relatively small number of journals that comply today. Uh, look at the effect of Plan S as a, uh, a catalyst of change, and then see later how many journals comply. But then to confront the main question, uh, what does it matter if your funder requires you to publish in certain journals and not others because the others are not compliant? Uh, you don't have to take their money. Uh, there are other funders. It might matter if uh, every funder in the world did this or if the majority of funders did this, but uh, I've argued in the past that university open access policies have to support author freedom to publish in the journals of their choice, but funder policies don't have to respect that freedom. Uh, universities uh, protect academic freedom. It's part of their mission. It's not part of the mission for funding agencies. Uh, funding agencies have a very simple rationale here. Uh, we want to spend our money in the public interest. We uh, can do that by funding high quality research that uh, serves a range of public interests and making the results open access. Uh, we insist on that. It's part of our charitable purpose. Uh, and so if you don't like that, then don't take our money. Find another funder who's willing to let you do good research and lock it up. Uh, we're not willing to do that. Uh, I commend funders who take that position, uh, and authors who resent funders who take that position should look at their research grant next time, regardless of which funder gave it. There are lots of restrictions on what they can do with the money and what they cannot do. Uh, you have to spend it, let's say, on uh, beakers uh, and not on uh, vacations. Uh, perfectly reasonable restriction. In this case, the restriction has a transparent rationale to serve the public interest. Uh, and because there's currently a choice of funders, I think they can uh, honestly say, legitimately say, uh, this is what we want, this is how we serve our charitable purpose, and if you don't like it, then you don't have to take our money. There are other objections, that it's bad for societies, that it's bad for early career researchers. Uh, I think those are more easily answered. Uh, sometimes the Plan S criteria are, uh, say, nitpicking, they're very uh, finicky about uh, small details uh, when they might not have to be when they could take a broader vision. But part of what's exciting is that it's a coalition of funders. The coalition itself is growing and they're determined to uh, change journal behavior and not just change author behavior. It's been fascinating to continue to talk with you about the evolution of open access. You were with us for Open Learning 2017, um, and you've been very supportive of our CMOOC, and it's been wonderful to have you with us again to share your thoughts about open access. Thank you. It's good to be here, and good luck to all you students who are taking that MOOC. <laughs> <laughs>